Welcome to LeapCast. I'm your host, Dr. George James. LEAP stands for leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. And I'm on a journey to connect with high achievers and highlight their unexamined human moments. Tune in to learn how these high achieving LEAP individuals were able to reach their greatest potential, face their most difficult challenges, and embrace the human moments that helped them along the way. If you want to get the episode highlights directly in your email, then head to theleapcasts.com right now to subscribe. Well, welcome everybody once again to LeapCast. This is your host, Dr. George James, where we talk to leaders, entertainers, athletes, and performers. I'm excited for our guest today, uh, someone that you've seen on the screen in many ways, and I've seen uh, Malik Yoba, who is an actor, director, entrepreneur, and I think I just found out like a musician, low key. So we're going to hopefully learn more about that. Uh, Malik, thanks for joining me today and, and uh, for this podcast, LeapCast. And we like to start off by just learning a little bit more about what we call your Leap story. So like the early beginnings, stuff that maybe you've shared or maybe you haven't shared about how this all started, your career, your path, your passion. Uh, so kind of bring us to the beginning. How did it all start for you? And welcome. My parents had sex, bro, in January. I was born in, in September. So. That is the earliest it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a uh, cold night in January in New York in 1967. Nice. Nine months later, on September 17th, a uh, little ashy baby filled, covered in eczema came out. And um, yeah, man, born in the South Bronx, raised in Harlem. Um, and uh, to a very progressive father. Um, what do you mean by that? Father, what do you mean by progressive? He, he was he was a black nationalist. My father. So my last name Yoba, as a for instance, he made up the name and he gave it a meaning. Last of the slaves, a new generation. He took the the name Nature Boy and spelled it backwards, um, which is Erotan Yob. He was born Milton Myers, M Y E R S, which is an English spelling, but as a as a black man with a name that sounded very Jewish in New York City. And he came here in pursuit of his musical dream. You're in Philly. He was born in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. Okay, yeah. Moved to New York when he was 15 to I chase the mayor of Aliquippa, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've met him. Uh, I don't know if he's still the mayor. I haven't been there in a few years, but uh, last I knew it was a black dude, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 big dude. Oh, That's what yeah. he <laughs> He's yeah, a, he's a good dude. I, I yeah, he is. Him and we he definitely, yeah, he's definitely loves the city. And I hadn't been there. I, the first time I ever went was 2013. Okay. Um, so my father left home and left all his memories behind. It was kind of estranged from most of his family for most Mayor of Dewan our life. Mayor Walker, that's his name. I had to. That's it. That. that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and then um, he uh, he was born Milton Myers, and then. In 1959, he, as a jazz musician, was playing in a club and had an out-of-body experience. Okay. And he said he felt himself crying and his, he could, his body sort of rise up off the bandstand. He could see himself. And he needed to find out who the god of music was. And so that's what he said. And he uh, pursued Islam. He was born Christian. And uh, he... His friends used to call him Nature Boy, based on the Nat King Cole song of the same title. Um, and so that's where he got that from. And he was tired of showing up as Milton Myers and people think a white dude's gonna show up. So <laughs> Nature Boy he was, then he spelled it backwards. And so he added the A and he gave it a meaning, last of the slaves, a new generation. So we were raised by a man who was definitely not thinking about, we never will participate in the status quo. Yeah. Um, he always preached about incompetence in the workplace, as we would always say, competence in the workplace, incompetence in the workplace. And uh, he, he, you know, it was six of us, my parents separated when I was 10. All six of us stayed with him. Where um, were you in the line of six? I'm four from the top. Okay. And I'm three from the bottom. Some people like to say the middle, but I just say they can't count. <laughs> like, like, it's me it's and one other. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, he was a, he was an interesting guy, man. And he, you know, used to say, you're going to hate me as a kid, but love me as an adult. Mm -hmm. But what I realized is my father is currently raising a whole bunch of other people. 
because okay. even though he passed when I was 28, so, you know, 20, however many years ago that was, um, more than half of my life ago, but he, um, he, or just about half of my life ago, he, he had a lot of phrases and a lot of sayings that we all repeat. And it's funny because like my brother and I, my brother was sharing, uh, an essay he wrote recently okay. and a quote of my father's was keep your head in your pocket and your pockets will always stay full. Um, and I was like, damn, I forgot about that one. Cause I live by, and it's tattooed right here in my arm. Okay. Uh, build your own generator. So when they turn off the power, you still have lights. Nice. So as a yard man, you can't. I was relate. about to say like, come from, from the, I, I know about the generator. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta always have your own and build your own. So, um, you know, I had a, a paper route in Harlem from eight years old to 16. So I've always been hustling and nice. figuring out how to make my own money, um, regardless of what I'm doing uh, as a J-O-B. And I've never really, you know, I mean, I guess we all have jobs, but I've never really thought of myself yeah. as an employee, even if I'm working for someone else, because I've always been thinking about the big picture, always. And sometimes it's got me in trouble. Sometimes people embrace it. Um, so that's a little bit about my beginning. No, I love that, man. And I appreciate you sharing, like, you know, a little bit about, you know, how the past generations influence us even currently, and, and more importantly, how your father has influenced you and how you think about it. And like, that is progressive, right? The thought of him saying, look, look I, I don't have to accept what these other people have named me. I'm going to name myself and put meaning to it and, and then have his own sayings right like you know when you talk about the generator i know like you know like i i shared with you briefly that my all my family's from jamaica like aunts uncles parents grandparents the whole nine i was in my family the first one born in the states but i i did two years of education in jamaica so i know at you eat yeah uh, no no uh, before that i did a kindergarten and first grade so early, oh, all the way primary school, all the way yeah. primary school right and <clears throat> so i'm knowing them can cut off the light anytime <laughs> Right? right. So like, I understand that whole thing about, you know, keeping that light uh, within you. So I mean, that that's that that's awesome. So so you went with your father, you said when you were 10. Well, we didn't, I didn't go with him. And my mother left the house. Okay. So my mother, my grandmother, no, we, he stayed put. She called the cops and the cops asked her to leave, which is crazy. Wow. Um, that would never happen. A man with six kids by himself. And at that time, he was like 50. And so the, I don't know how that happened. And I was there, but it happened. And so, yeah, it left also deep wounds. I mean, you know, you work in mental health. So as much as my father sort of gave us these foundational principles to stand on, which I'm very, very grateful for, and, you know, diligently worked to instill those in my kids and you know, they, they were in their own process. Of <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> the next generation. Look, I talk about that often. The things that put us on our ground and our purpose, we try to instill that in the next generation, and it doesn't always land the way that we no, think it does. No, sir. Is. No, sir. No, no, sir. But I'm batting three, 300, so, okay. or 330, because I got three kids and one, she's all about it. The other two, they may be about it. They just aren't showing it to me right now, but the one... <laughs> that is like my twin she's she's 21 and she's it's so amazing to watch like you know all the things that i've done you know as a kid like she she does them. like she went to work just a little while ago and she's like you know i can't believe i made this skirt out of a pair of pants nice. and that was me i was making shit <laughs> sewing you know what she insisted we knew how to do sewing and like he was very much like you're gonna learn how to be a domestic Yep. Not that he wanted to clean people's houses, but yep. I own house. Cook, clean, show, sew, shop, budget, like run the family. Like he did the, all that. Like, so I love to see that. And when the kids do it. Yeah. I hear you. My mom would tell me, uh, you know, once again, time <clears throat> is where she could say it this way. Right. Uh, she would tell me growing up uh, as being the only boy, you're going to be you're going to be the boy and the girl. You're going to learn all the different things that we normally would teach young girls and all the things that we teach young boys. We're going to teach them all to you. So it's not about boy or girl. You're going to learn all the skills. Yep. So so that happened. And as you said, like, obviously, that's a, a major transition in your life. Uh, and we don't, I mean, even just from a father perspective, you don't really hear 
that much where you have six children and they the children stay with the father i mean i think there's more stories as we we can ask people we hear that but typically we don't hear that how do and then i hear like your ability to be creative your ability to kind of find ways to earn money how did you then start to pursue being a being creative i hear like the your dad being a musician did was that was music and creativity like a part of the yeah house? it was it was like it was around us so as a musician he used to have his friends come over jazz cats so you come you at the crib and there's a dude with upright bass as a horn player he's playing guitar maybe a drummer so there was always that there was always music playing it was he had the old school reel the reels so he always played charlie parker you know miles davis billy holiday like those are some of his 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 favorite um, John Coltrane, so and I hated jazz as a kid. Like I didn't get it, and the standard I was like, "That's fucking noise." <laughs> but his guitar is the first guitar I picked up. Okay. Um, and we grew up without television because he refused to have an idiot box in the house. Mm -hmm. So there was crayons, crayons, and construction paper, a lot of books, magazines, but specific ones like National Geographic subscription. Mm -hmm. So mentally, you're always traveling around the world. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I'd pull out the map of the world and close my eyes and point, like, and go, okay, my wife's in, and I look, and oh, she's in Madagascar. Like, as a kid, I never thought my wife was in New York. I always I, thought she'd be somewhere else in the world. <clears throat> um, you gotta go find her. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, um, I had um, visions of, you know, just always traveling, and we did travel. We did some travel to the Caribbean, um, to Canada, road trips to DC. That was his thing, a lot of road trips. Um, and then my mother, um, in the time she was there until I was 10, <clears throat> she was big on the arts. So taking us to see theater. I saw Alice in Wonderland when I was four mm -hmm. off Broadway. That's the thing that made me want to be uh, uh, an actor. Um, and then, you know, we had the drama programs at school at the time, still in New York. So always dreaming about being on stage. And so it was, it was a lot of creativity and, and I was punished a lot. So I got in trouble a lot, um, which was <laughs> really- Construction paper, about. so you got to use your mind, right? So there was, yeah, we're always making stuff, bro. Writing plays, performing them for our family and neighbors to come charging them a quarter. Nice. So it was always that, yeah. So I, I hear it, right? Like I hear like the environment that it was there for you to to see and embrace creativity to embrace the world to use your mind and all your skills and talents and it sounds like you're saying what from what four you kind of had that desire to be on stage yeah yeah, yeah. So whatever that magic i saw i didn't know what it was i just yeah. was like whatever that is i want to do that <clears throat> and then by elementary school you know by second probably even earlier than that maybe kindergarten First grade, there's some school play. I was always in school plays, always in the drama club, um, always performing. Um, so yeah, man, this has always been creative. No, I love that. You know, for me in my work in my career, like, you know, my parents didn't have a lot of education, so it was about like, you know, encouraging me to to go forward. Right, they, my mother barely had a high school. My father couldn't read. And yet somehow, like they were, my father was delivering like stuff in New York City, like without like the ability to fully read. I don't know how he did it, but he learned the roads and he would do the things and would know how to drop off things um, for our, our party mm -hmm. rental company. And and so that was a big push in, in our family or encouragement because they saw how the lack of education impacted them. But it was a while before I recognized my own creativity. It was probably until like high school that I recognized I was performing, I was doing other things. Uh, and so it's great to hear how creativity was embraced early and encouraged early in your life. And it sounds like maybe you felt like you could probably do whatever you wanted, at least creatively. Well, it was definitely, well, yes and no. Like he didn't want us to do it professionally. Uh, he was like, you gotta get a vocation, not just an avocation. That was another one of his saying. Um, but I think that was more about his un, his dreams deferred as a musician. And he recognized how hard it was. So he definitely did not encourage pursuit professionally. And he used to say dumb shit, like you can't make money off your God-given talent. And as a kid, I was like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why would you tell me that? 
Yeah. Like, what the hell else am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, do a job I hate, like you're doing? I'm not going to do that. So I had that awareness as a Good. kid that I, like, I'm going to pursue my heart's desires. And that's the part that always got me in trouble. Because he would say, you always want to take the road of least resistance. And in my mind, I'm like, um, and like, why would you not? Like, not that I didn't, like, he made just living in the house hard. Yeah. Like, there was no, because it, like, kids woke, woke up on Saturday morning and watched t- cartoons. We didn't do that. There was no TV. We woke up and had to get on our hands and knees and scrub the fucking baseboards and clean all the, the cabinets where our fingerprints were and the light switches and spick and span. Like, had to put the chairs upside down on the table mop the floor, take the garbage out, clean the garbage pail. Like no chrome or stainless steel was not allowed to be shiny. So you, the tub, the sinks, all the fixtures, everything was spick and span. Now I get it, there's six of us. So he had to run it like the military because he would say, you're gonna hate me as a kid, but love me as an adult. And it's true because this world is filled with people that don't get it. Man, and I hear what I was wondering, like, I hear <clears> lots of stories about the Saturday morning cleaning. Uh, with the music with the, old, with the old hits on? Yep. I was wondering what music was playing for y'all. <laughs> well, we were allowed to listen to the radio. Mm-hmm. So at that time, there was a lot of Casey Kasem, Top 40. This is before black, before music was was so segmented. Yeah. So those were those are fun memories, actually because you listen to Cat Stevens and the Jacksons and James Brown and the Carpenters and, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and Tina Turner. And so there was that sort of melange, you know, of, of, of music um, that I grew deep, deep appreciation for. Um, And I also hear you like the thought of like, you know, your father being difficult and challenging at times and probably maybe from his perspective had to, uh, I think like in, in this day and age, like we wrestle with like how much of that do we need versus not uh, on some level. I see a lot of people who don't have a work ethic because maybe they didn't practice that at home or they didn't know how to like, even though you don't want to, you need to and you should. Yeah, man, that, that's problematic, especially if you have children with people who don't share that value. And I unfortunately or fortunately, I guess how you look at it, have had that experience where, you know, you're looked at as the bad guy because you're insistent that your kids, like, there's no excuses. Like, what is that under your bed? Clean that up. What is that yeah. behind? Like, what are you doing? Right. Right. Like, no, you're not just gonna put that in the closet. No, and dad, no. And even if you're not with the other parent, like in my case, I go over to their crib and I'm like, uh-uh, mm-hmm. no. Like, you ain't gonna be this kid going to college. You have a dirty room. Like, no one wants to live with a pig. Right. So you we talk not about gonna- those people. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, and you're not gonna be carrying this family name out there, like. But that part is interesting, you know, because to your point, like I remember taking my kids to go play tennis once, and the tennis center was closed, but a friend of mine runs it, and so she let us go in and like hit balls, <clears throat> and it's time to go. So I'm like, all right. Y'all pick up the balls and my son starts crying. And he was like seven, six at the time, whatever. And I'm like, boy, you better get, listen, I don't care if you're crying, go pick up those. And he's like bawling. And my oldest sister said, you know, even if you didn't hit your kids the way our father hit us, mm-hmm. it's your energy yeah. that you're passing on to them. Yeah. And knowing what I know now, how the world doesn't give a damn about you, and this intestinal fortitude that I have and this resilience and that grit and all those things that allow us to even be here right now, because if I was a different person, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Yeah. The things I've been through, listen, no. And the only thing I have to reach back on is are those foundational truths about show up, show up on time. In fact, on time is late. Mm -hmm. five minutes early right like being consistent the follow-through being about your word right all of those 
basic tenets of successful quote unquote people because there's the people who are successful who don't follow up i see that too which is kind of mind-blowing too <laughs> like yo how's this person how, how, how do you it? put on really right because you don't follow like you don't return a phone call like clearly you do to some people right but That's you right. ain't to me right but whatever that is but no i mean i hear you and i think like <clears throat> You know, part of these conversations that I, I've been having with people is that it is those moments that we don't always hear and know, right? It is the experience of your father, the experience of being, you know, one of six, right? Like it's the experience of how did that, you know, that fortitude get developed, that work ethic get developed that then helps you as you move forward. And what I find, you know, I was just having a conversation just yesterday with a, a, a couple client that I was working with of like the challenge sometimes is then how do we transfer that to the next generation? Because they don't have the same circumstances, right? They don't right. have, they don't yeah, have the same part. situation, right? So how do you like try to share that? And, and it's often a challenge. Like, you know, I grew up not really, we didn't have money, right? So like there was a drive there. They didn't have a lot of education. There's a drive there. But now my wife and I got doctor degrees. All right, there's a different thing that we got to communicate to our kids to help have them to think about. Yeah, right. I got two. I got two kids, a nine-year-old son and eleven-year-old daughter, trying to help them think about like the how they see themselves, while balancing those messages that I learned that I value, and not trying to re 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 repeat the ones that I don't yeah. value. Yeah, and I think um, yeah, it's hard. But my twenty-one-year-old gave me a letter recently because she sees me, like you know, having the co-parent situation not living in the same house they didn't always get it right and so the goal was always eventually they need to live with me full time so they could see it so fortunately only one at this point and they're, they're 24 21 and 20 now so 20 year olds in college 24 year old graduated the 21 year old lives with me for the last like three years and so she sees me like her mother used to say to her and your father really has a, what did she say? Um, like he's, he's so blessed. He's got a, a anointing on his life, whatever she would say to suggest that it's only through this covering. Mm. And I believe there's a covering because I know who I serve and how I move mm -hmm. and why, mm -hmm. right? And what I listen to, Yeah. more importantly. Um, but she never got to see the day in and day out. And she will know, like, I could be here in this crib on this computer working and she goes to school or goes to work and comes back 10 hours, 12 hours later, I'm still right there. And she sees me edit, she sees me write, she sees me direct, she sees me do my real estate. Like she's seen it. <clears throat> and it's different if I'm on set. <clears throat> and when they were little, I bring them to sets, they travel around the world. And that's different because it's like, okay, dad's an actor, but the business person, yeah, yeah, the community activist person, the entrepreneur, that stuff that, and I, and I purposely do shit like whether it's a Zoom or speakerphone so she can hear it. And she's, <laughs> and you know, and if maybe about a month ago, two months ago, she wrote me this letter. She go, like, God just told me to write this to you. Mm. And it was, a, it was gratitude. It was yeah. like, I just want to tell you, dad, like, I see you every day, do what you do. And I just want to keep you encouraged to keep going because it's really inspiring me. And then, you know, she's out in the world and she's bragging and not for the things people would think oh, she bra yeah. bragging about. It ain't about, cause you, I've, you've seen my dad in this movie or that TV show, whatever. She's like, no, like when, like on the real estate side, she's like, dad, there was a guy who works in the building next to my job. And he told me about, like your buildings and things that you're doing on the real estate side. Like she was more proud of that yeah. than any TV credit. Cause she knows like, I don't own that shit. Like no matter how many movies or TV you've seen me into this point, none of that is my IP. Yeah. And that's a real problem for me, especially now at this age, because I've spent so much time in service of that dream. Yeah. And that dream has provided a certain lifestyle that is very easy to be comfortable get well now it can for some people i've been blessed right so i didn't really feel the struggle that a lot of people feel for most of my career 
The last few years, it's been different because my one, it's like the combination of the flow in your life is different because of the energy you're putting into these other visions. Yeah. I don't sit around and think about, I can't wait for my next acting job unless I wrote it, <laughs> which I just did wrote a, a pilot recently. Nice. And, but you know, whether it's books or, you know, I'm writing other films, like then it's, it's different because I'm looking at it again from a job creation perspective. And I, I, and I get to pour all of those years of mm. bringing characters to life for someone else's vision. And all that I've learned about storytelling, and directing and writing and producing and acting goes into this entrepreneurial effort. Yeah. I used to teach a class called The Working Actor at LIU. Uh -huh. um, and it was all about you are the CEO of You Incorporated. So understand the business of show is the business of show and you better show your business. Mm -hmm. Right. And so understand that as artists, we're entrepreneurs. Because as artists, I'm, well, you know, I'm struggling. And like this question, people like that, yo, are you working? Or even worse to me, yo, I'm, I'm glad you're working. Like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, really, like, think yeah. about that. I'm glad you're working. I appreciate it. But what they're saying is, I'm glad someone is hiring you. Mm -hmm. And well, I don't I always like say, you stopped working in between. A lot of people do though. Right. A lot of actors I know, like that's what they do. Well, I'm just an actor. And then they get caught up in the fame of it all. And I gotta keep this profile. I'm like, fuck that shit. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. nah. Like, I just got off a call with a woman that's put me up on game on federal contracts. Mm -hmm. Right? There's programs out here that they will never advertise. Nope. Billions of dollars and procurement going to business. And I don't even have to be in a business. I, basically it's project management. Mm -hmm. Like I was looking at some stuff today. I'm like, what? <laughs> These kind of numbers providing catering service for the US military, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be in the same city. I know people in the food industry all over this country. I'm like, okay, I'm doing that. Yeah, I just That's saw someone that. who got, I didn't say, someone showed me an article of a uh, fairly young i think 39 year old black guy who got a billion dollar contract from the from the government so like it it's there and it's possible but I, you know i really appreciate a few things that you're highlighting right the the thought of you know that there are lots of different things that one that you are doing that you are using the skills you've learned from being creative from your father from growing up from being an uh, from being an actor that you also use in real estate and being an entrepreneur and that your children in particular your 21 year old sees it and is proud of it and wants to encourage that and I, I mean i think that that's just dope when your when your kids can see you and see your work and want to like encourage that even more i think that that's a that's a great place to be and then this thought of like how how do people go about thinking about owning what they do thinking about creating opportunities for themselves because i think there are ways that we can settle into just accepting what somebody else's vision and maybe for a period of time that's what you need to do and that's Absolutely. okay and like i've done it you've done it there's nothing wrong with that but there's also the ability to one of these things is talk that i, I give often it says i i give myself permission it's okay to give yourself permission to create for yourself for other people and to let people in on that. So I really love how you were highlighting that in what you were saying. And I think it's incredible, right? That you recognize all these gifts, probably maybe infused from early on in your life. And now you're you're doing that in so, so many ways. Yeah, and I think gratitude is important, right? So, you know, there was a time, like, you know, I see a Jamaican flag and I think about when I screen tested for Cool Runnings, what that felt like. I went to an open call at SOBs, a club here in New York in 1991. Um, my boy called me and said, hey, they're doing this movie about the Jamaican bobster team. And you should go call this woman and go down. And I didn't have an agent, didn't have a headshot. There was no resume at the time that I, I had 
credits, but they were like theater credits yeah, and yeah. a couple other small like films, but there was no major film. And I remember <clears throat> getting that call three o'clock in the afternoon one day saying, you know, can you fly to LA tomorrow? Cause you, you, you did this audition two months prior and the director saw it and would like to meet you. And, and I'm like, what? I got a job. I can't just leave. And I talked <laughs> talk to my boss and I used to work for a group called the city kids foundation, which was the best kind of job. Cause I got to be creative and mm. use all of my skill sets. And as a young person, started volunteering there when I was 19. So at this point, I'm like 24. I'm, you know, doing work in education. I'm doing work in music. I'm, you know, producing stuff. I'm raising money. I'm learning all of these things as a young person in a nonprofit that was very, very cool. And I was happy. Yeah. And I was like, ah, really? Fly to LA. And shoot, my boss like, you better go. Yeah. <laughs> and I know what it was like to land in LA and walk on that Disney lot and walk in the sound stage back in the day when they used to do old school screen tests, when they have a little film crew set up on an empty stage and, you know, a little set and just, you know, shoot you with other actors. They don't really do that anymore. Um, now it's like, put yourself on your, you can tape yourself on your camera yeah. and send that in. I know but a lot of people that, doing self tapes. Yeah. The self tapes. Exactly. So the magic of being on that lot mm. and walking through the, those, the, the, the you know, the alleyways and walking onto the stages and feeling the energy and the history of that, that felt incredible. Yeah. Wow, oh, man. It's like being four again and seeing Alice in Wonderland, right? Like seeing the magic. Oh, 1000%. Feeling. But doing that for 30 years, yeah, it's like going to the office. Like you, yeah. you know it. I still get the, I still love, there's nothing like being on the set. Like I, I there's a part of me that's like, it's still such a little kid in fact literally i couldn't sleep last night and i'm watching one of my favorite uh youtube channels there's a few of them film courage is one one's called studio binder okay. where like i was you know they're dissecting uh denis villeneuve uh his film sicario and there's a scene when emily blunt and you know benicio del toro get to the mexican border and they see the 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 um the uh, the Mexican you know gang members that they're after, and just breaking down how he creates the tension mm. using camera size sizes, right, lens sizes, and you know where the camera, how it's moving, how it's edited, like that's the four year old again, yeah, like yeah, that shit yeah. never gets old, yeah, yeah. right? Because I'm constantly studying, like because I'm directing a lot more. Okay. And I'm like, man, that shit is nuts. I would have never thought about that. And I'm in the business. And so, yes, there's that part that will always humble you, mm -hmm. make you grateful that you're in it. But at the end of the day, and I would love to work with a director like that. I have no problem being an employee on a Denis Villeneuve film. Put me in Dune 2, put me in anything that dude does. <laughs> He's a master. I want to work with him. However, um, because I'm a constant student, I'm gonna steal all his shit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm gonna fucking, what I'm directing, because it's projects I'm directing, I can use those exact same techniques and go, okay. So it's this interesting dance between, you know, if gratitude for having been an employee, um, you know, for many years, but also being an employer, yeah. which is my greatest joy. Yeah. Um, and just the gratitude of everything I've learned and being able to take all of these years of experience and pour them into everything, you know, that I'm, that I'm currently doing. Um, yeah, I, I, really, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I really love personally being in a place of gratitude. I am so grateful for my parents, right. And what they've done, you know, you know, from coming from, like I said, coming from Jamaica to the U S not having a lot of education, being people of faith, working hard, all that they instilled, right? And so fast forward, when they were sick, right? For me, it was like, I had had no choice. It was my honor to then be able to care for them because of all that they gave to me, right? And so this level of gratitude, so I could hear that in terms of all that you've experienced being on set, be, being able to be in different places, work with different folks. And there was no way that you was going to, I was going to have a conversation with you without talking about cool runnings. So, uh -huh. so I'm glad that you brought that up. And, and I didn't realize that you didn't, 
like have the headshot or the agent and that it it was something that you pursued and worked out uh and well i have to i want to be yes i did pursue it but I, go ahead finish your question no, no, I, was just, you. I was just i was wondering like what what stage of your career was that and, and how did that impact the rest of your career so um the truth is you know i am a community servant first and foremost I have like as an artist, I'm clear around the role that we play as agents of change and healers, right? And so for me, my work with the City Kids Foundation, which started with me volunteering at 19 years old, because I'd heard of the organization two years prior. And the person who told me about it sent me to another place in Harlem first. And I tutored kids and taught theater, work, taught theater, worked in an after school program, summer camp with them. Then made my way to City Kids Foundation, where I started volunteering. Then I was hired to work in 13 high schools to help reduce the dropout rate. Awesome. But the organization itself used art to engage young people. So we had a repertory company that would perform, which I refused to be a part of, actually because I was much more interested in the administration and the running of the business of it, yeah. right? But I would occasionally jump on stage or write a song or whatever. So one, the summer of 1989, the organization ran, the grant ran out that was high, that was paying for my salary for the first three years. So I told my boss, I'll volunteer that summer. Hmm. And I went to work one day and there was a sign on the wall <clears throat> and it was, for, it was a um, flyer, uh, announcing an audition for a film. And that film was written by a guy named Jamal Joseph, who um, had just gotten out of prison for his, his involvement in the Black Panther Party. He spent 10 years in Leavenworth prison. Jamal Joseph also happened to be Tupac's godfather. Mm -hmm. um, so Jamal ran with a Fanny Shakur. Um, and he uh, wrote a film called Seriously Fresh, which was about uh, it was an age education film that I, that was my very first film, 1987. I did that film, 88. It's like 20 or 21. And um, in doing that film, so I, I, I see the, the ad, I do the audition and I get that film. Sure. I meet Jamal on set. He tells me his story about being in the Black Panther Party. I said, yo, during February, because we shot in like August, and I want you to come talk to my kids about for, during Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And we invite him down. We end up loving him. We hired him to run the repertory company. Nice. Jamal is the person who called me up and said, hey, they're doing this movie about the Jamaican bobsled team. You should go audition. Now, he had previously said, I'm going to make you famous. <laughs> and he thought I was going to play him in a film he was writing about his role, his, his journey in the Black Panther Party. So I had no acting career at that time other than high school plays, junior high school plays, working at the Negro Ensemble Company, being at 16 as an usher and with people like Felicia Rashad and Sam Jackson and you know Denzel had just done Soldiers Play there and Adolf Caesar and Angela Bassett. So I knew I was around all those people as a kid. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to act, but I didn't like the idea of other people telling me when I can work. <laughs> so as a musician, I, I pursued that, right? I play guitar, I wrote music, I wrote the theme song for Cool Running. That enough people are saying that I can't believe Jamea Cole. Yeah. I wrote that for yeah. my audition. So I um Wait, you wrote it going into the audition? Yeah, I wrote it because as you know, every Jamaican, you know about Jamaica. You <laughs> right. no matter where. Yeah. You're, you're in, a, in a restaurant, the cook's got a song, yeah. the driver has a song, the bellman, everybody got a fucking song in Jamaica. <laughs> So you notice, know I was like, yeah. I'm gonna pull up with a song. And I so know. I wrote that and it ended up in the movie. And you know, the producer was like, would you mind putting that in the movie? I'm like, ah, uh, I'm a published writer with ASCAP since 1991. Yes, it's going in the movie. Yeah, credits. <laughs> credits and cash. So absolutely. Um, but that's how that started. You know, I, I auditioned, mm -hmm. got that movie and then the career started. And I didn't even know it was a career at the time. I just knew I did this movie 
And then I went back to my job at City Kids. We had a Saturday morning show with the Muppets at the time. And I was a co-musical director. So I flew back from Jamaica, went to LA because my partner and I, we were producing out there and I'm in the studio and, you know, I think, and, and in fact, my first agent, so when I got the movie, I had no agent. So I auditioned and they were like, uh, you're gonna need an agent to negotiate the deal. Mm. So they gave me a list and first one was William Morris and the woman was on vacation. So she wasn't available. I went down the list. The second one was a place called Ambrosia Mortimer. And Sam Jackson at the time and Angela Bassett were rep, rep by them. And because I knew them from the Negro Ensemble Company, I felt like, oh, I know those two people, so I'm gonna sign up with these people. Right, right. And it was like very random. Um, and so that's how it started. And then I went back to work on the music. And at some point I got an audition for, um, New York on the cover. So actually I done, I think I did the movie first. And then once the movie came out and you're like this new person mm -hmm. in the ecosystem, people want to meet you. Yeah. Casting directors want to meet you. And, you know, so I ended up doing these two movies for Miramax, did an AT&T commercial in Jamaica with some people from the crew from- I did you sell? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, it was AT&T. And then um, I got Law and Order mm -hmm. and then did an episode of Dougie Doug's show, Where I Live, and then booked New York on the cover. Mm -hmm. So this all happened in five months of the movie coming out. And I was like, well, I guess I'm acting now. And that's, yeah. that's kind of how that started. You know, what I, what I appreciate about that is, <clears throat> you know, I don't think people often recognize how just being being a good dude, uh, connecting with people, uh, having your passion was really, you know, like you say, be empowering these young folks and being of service to these young folks. And in pursuing that, your gifts, your talents, uh, and ability created relationships and opened up other opportunities that then open a career that you wasn't necessarily envisioning at that time and in that way? Definitely not. I mean, I was I was more of a theater guy. Mm. I mean, I was my dream. In fact, I have a one man show that's set in a therapist's office. <laughs> I play about 20 characters in it. It's it's my opus or one of them, I guess. But I don't know if you have more than one, but it, it's my writing. It's my music. It's poetry. It's, I'm rapping. I'm fucking tap dancing. I play about 20 characters in it. And all of that stuff is in me. And film and TV doesn't always have an opportunity yeah. to bring this stuff out, especially if you're, I'm playing an Italian dude or an old Jewish woman or French guy, or like all these things that people would never think to cast me in yeah. because they don't, one, they don't know me, know me, know me, know me, and they don't have vision. And why would they? It's like me looking at you like, really? You can do a, a old Jewish woman? Yes, I can. I do all of those things. <clears throat> um, but it's set in a therapist's office on purpose because it's important to see Black men vulnerable in those spaces. Yes. And this is something I started working on in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I've done different iterations of it over the years. Most recently at the Apollo in New York in 2019. We did it a couple of times. And I was going to tour it in 2020 and then the world changed. Right. But it will hopefully in 2023, I'll remount it and shoot it and it'll be out in the world and people will see it uh, broadly. But the goal was ownership yeah. and control. Yeah. I just got lucky for 30 years where people keep hiring you. Either you get an offer or you audition for something. And it, it worked relatively smoothly. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, so now I feel like I'm coming back down to earth as it were, because the work that I'm doing with Yoba development, um, and real estate development is inclusive of filmmaking, mm -hmm. education, all the things I've ever done. Yeah. Like, you know, telling these stories of my journey into development on film, using that film to go into schools and communities, college level, high school level to educate and empower and entertain, but it also creates deal flow. Yeah. Um, so I've, I found this, this lane 
where all the things I've ever done, being an entrepreneur, being an activist, being an educator, being a storyteller, working in film, um, being a business person, all of those things, I all sort of coalescing in this, this work where, you know, it's like, it's just back to my roots, which I never left. I never stopped doing that work, but. Of course. Uh, yeah. And, I, and I, I love it because, you know, this way of how these things can come together, you know, for me, when I was in grad school learning to be a therapist, I was also actively going on auditions. I was, you know, auditioning in Philly and in New York. I was doing background work because I was fascinated, you know, by that world. I didn't have the full picture of what it would do, but because of that, I got real comfortable with being on camera and as my career moved forward, I was able to now take mental health stuff and put that on camera and talk about that and be comfortable. And, you know, a lot of therapists are not comfortable with being on camera, not comfortable with being in front of people or speaking or talking. And so these ways that our skills and talents can come together is so can be so special. And I really appreciate how you've been true to yourself, true to even what you've learned from your dad and your mom growing up from your family and how it's been consistent throughout. And like you said, you, 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 you were on the wave of like just doing it for 30 years and now really in this place of ownership, I think that's just something that lots of people miss. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I would always say at some point, 80% of my income is going to come from the shit I create yeah. and I'm at that place. Yeah. And, um, it's just a matter of how much of that income, right? What does that number look like? Yeah. <laughs> so still got to work yeah. to get to that place. And, and that's the thing that Hollywood has given me. It's altered my reality, yeah. right? You work in film and television and you can earn a great living. And there is an association we make with, oh, you're going to pay me how much for mm -hmm. just an hour? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Like people make that in a year. Yeah. Yeah. Or this we gonna make in a week. Like when I did cool runnings, I made more money in 12 weeks than my father made in a year. Yeah. And that skews things. Yeah. So you have the sense of worth that is associated with a dollar amount. Um, and you gotta be careful because if only one gift is generating that and you don't have the opportunity to exercise and develop those other gifts so that they can be on par with that hmm. you have some work to do to close yeah. that gap and that's where i'm at right now no i mean i think that's so powerful right that we can lean into one gift because it's out, out front or it's making us money or it's getting us opportunities but there's so many other skills and gifts that could either make as much money or be fulfilling or add value to the world or make you a impact. whole lot more yeah yeah because at the end of the day I've never been paid what I'm worth as an actor, ever. And then even when you get like to a number where you're like, okay, this is really respectful. And that becomes your quote. The next gig, they're like, yeah, well, we know you got paid that for that, but we only got this. And you're like, yo, that's half of what the fuck are we talking about? Yeah, yeah. And then you still want me to audition for this. Yeah. After 30 years and prove to someone else mm -hmm. that I'm right for your vision. Mm -hmm. I'm at a place where it's almost impossible for me to do that. <laughs> it's almost impossible. Like, and I'll tell them like, yo, y'all trying to pull me out of retirement. <laughs> like this is, it's funny. Cause it was a show recently. It's dope I actually set in the therapist's office. It's a group of therapists and I hope it gets picked up. It's a great show written by one of the writers from this is us. Oh yeah. And yeah. Then, I, I, I remember hearing about that. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of Philly based, but yep, not really Philly based. K. Agonio, dope yeah. Nigerian woman, yeah. dope energy. In fact, I tested with this Jamaican woman um, and it was great. And you know, the whole thing, it's like me and her and this director I've worked with and a network I've been on. And I told him from straight up, I was like, yo, uh, this is dope. And so you you trying to pull me out of retirement. She's like, what are you talking about? I was like, girl, I'm not really trying to work on other people's stuff. Yeah. But you wrote something dope. So I give it a shot. So, you know, it goes down. It's up to me and another person. And it ain't about can I act. It's not about do I have a presence? Do I have a fan base? None of that shit. 
It's based on somebody else's idea yeah. on what they want for their thing or for her thing. Because afterwards she apologized. Like, I don't know how this shit even worked. I'm like, this business is so crazy. I'm like, you're right. But please go be, just let me come direct on it. Let me get picked mm-hmm. up. Yeah. I'll do that. But that's awesome. That now, I heard game? about that show. And I, I think, you know, as a therapist, I, I love hearing how mental health is more coming into mainstream it's a part of our conversation it's a part of seeing black men being vulnerable it's a part of families athletes entertainers because it is so needed so in the last few minutes because i I appreciate we could we could wrap for a minute i i want to really ask you a few few questions you've been saying it already so first one is what are what are you currently working on i've heard development i've heard real estate i've heard your own projects so all, all the above, <laughs> brother. So I have Yoba Development, which is my development company, real estate development company. And I always say the first real estate we own is in our minds. Yeah. <clears throat> and so Yoba Development is a builder of people, places, and things in that order. We do not own the communities that we live in. Mm-hmm. And unless we grow the human capacity to understand the grounds you stand on was built by someone, literally. Yeah. Not the dirt, the concrete, the asphalt, yeah. that building you're staring at, those windows, the like the our relationship to the built environment traditionally has been very passive. Right? We just live in these spaces, don't understand that these are businesses around us. So I'm really, really passionate about helping people reframe that part of their own narrative and get involved. And we have to start with young people. So we have school-based programs on a high school, college level, um, partnerships, uh, do a lot of community screenings. And I said, this is all in the last six months since I shot this doc in called a real estate mixtape, which drives a lot of this work. Um, there's a curriculum that goes with it. So it's creating a lot of opportunity nice. going to go into schools, you know, working with returning citizens, you know, former incarcerated people teaching that population yeah. about real estate development, not just how to be a construction worker, laborer, or, but no, how do you develop, Yeah, right? There's that and it's leading to actual development deals. <clears throat> so that allows me to be an entrepreneur, an activist, uh, a f- storyteller, all the things that I'm passionate about, right? Entrepreneur, as I said, <clears throat> so it's at that intersection of real estate, storytelling, filmmaking, activism. Um, in real estate. Um, but I'm also writing a lot. So just wrote a pilot um, set in the world of New York City real estate development, which we've never seen. It's like the wire from the cricket cops to the cricket fucking, uh, the, you know, city bureaucrats, <laughs> the billionaires down to the dudes literally on the ground, the laborers, like those, that's the cleanup crew on construction sites. Right. And this this series will track the story of a guy who comes from prison. Get the first job out of prison is as a laborer on a construction site. And he witnesses the death of someone uh, who falls on the site and the cover up and and his best friend ends up dying on the site. And that spurs him to really learn this business. He becomes a developer. And it's essentially my journey. Right. Teaching, you know, teaching people from the ground up all yeah. the layers of this business. So there's that. Um, there is a, a book that I'm writing, which is part memoir, part um, just reflections, self-help elements. There's mm-hmm. a curriculum that'll go with that because that'll go into schools. Um, you know, development project has led to redevelopment of a school in the South Bronx and sports and wellness complex, affordable housing. So. In a true yard man style. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm about to say, how many job you have? <laughs> but you know what it is, brother? Like, I love it, though. It's all about teamwork. It's about partnerships. Yeah. It's about holding vision. Yeah. And everyone doesn't have the vision, but there's a lot of great workers that are strategic and people who, you know, they don't see everything I see. And I don't see everything they see. And it's that symbiosis that's created by working together to execute. Um, but it's, you know, it's a must. You know, it's like... We all run die. I appreciate how you're also like, I'm going to empower the community. I'm going to build up other people. And I'm also going to be able to take care of myself and my family. 
Right. It, it doesn't have to be either or, right? And I right. think like I love really hearing that that's what you've been doing. If you could work with anybody, you've had the privilege of knowing people, working with different people, and this could any industry, right? Uh, who would you want to work with, or who would you want to collab with? So many people, man. I mean, you know, it's funny because I, I wish <laughs> I was telling a story the other day when, um, you know, when New York Undercover was the hottest shit on television, especially I, I for love, Black I, and Latino households. And everybody wants to meet you, this studio head, that studio head. I go to these meetings and go, so what are you excited to work on? I'm like, well, I'm opening a restaurant and I got this record label and I got this. I talk about everything but the film business. And I remember the first time I did that with the head of Sony Pictures, and I leave with my manager. She was like, don't ever fucking do that again. Now, that was really on her because she should have fucking informed me before I went in because I would have I would have played that game. But honestly, at that time, <clears throat> I couldn't have pointed to a director or an actor or a writer that I would have wanted to work with, which is what the studio had wanted to say, hear from me. Now I mentioned Denis Villeneuve. I mean, the Christopher Nolans of the world, the, you know, um, Alfonso Inuretu, like there's so many like amazing directors and writers and visionaries that I study mm. um, that I would love to work with. I wish I could have worked with Alfred Hitchcock. Or I wish, yeah. you know, I mean, there's so many people um, as, as artists um, that, that I would love to work with. Um, Denzel, like just thinking about like, you know, just seeing people's <laughs> process. Like I'm such a yeah. geek when it comes to that shit. Like, how do you do this? Yeah. And I've had a great fortune to work with a lot of amazing people. So on that side, but on the business side, there's so many people too, mm -hmm. like in every aspect of it, people in finance that I sit at their feet. Like I got into the development game because two young brothers, they're both younger than me, gave me a seat at the table 15 nice. years ago. Nice. And I study under these guys. Like, like, don't matter if you 10 years younger than me, Yep. You put me up on game. Like, <laughs> you know, like you, all those years I was on set, you were studying this shit. Yeah. So I'm like the humble student. This, I just got off the phone. I mean, Zoom with a woman. Like I told you, who's put me up on a federal contract game. I'm like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Like, and they don't promote this. I'm like, yo, that's now part of what I'm going to be doing is putting other people up on this game. So I'm constantly learning and surrounding myself with people who know more than me. Um, I'm on my way right now after this to the Harlem to work with a group. It's gonna be the first property management initiative in public housing in New York City. Wow. And as I'm talking to this woman with these SBA <clears throat> federal contracts, my mind is already like, okay, how do these resources get to filter to yeah. this organization I'm about to go work with to empower these people? these black and brown people, I think there's something like 3,200 residents mm. in public housing. They've already trained about 100 in this space of property management. So I wanna work with her. So I'm, I'm just like- I love it. I love, the, I love your, like you said, the student part of you, the nerd, the geek part, like, like going in on like, let me dig deeper and learn because that's you know how we grow and develop ourselves and our talents and our abilities. And I could just hear, how you're fascinated, and I, and I, I, I know that feeling of us. Like, no, I just want to, I just want to see how you do it. I want to learn more, and I could see that in, you know, in just what you're saying. Last two questions, and you've been saying some of this already, which I, I really appreciate. <clears throat> what does mental wellness mean to you? Well, number one, you know, my father used to always talk about. The, see what I do? I'm always referencing that dude. No, that's all um, right. I love it. <laughs> Uh, he always talked about the spirit is that thing that keeps your blood warm. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is mental wellness means awareness that there is a mental side of who you are. Yeah. That part of you that speaks to you when you ain't talking to nobody else, <laughs> that voice in your head. And being conscious of the you that isn't the thoughts. And most people think they are their thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And they don't realize that oftentimes your thoughts are about what you've heard from other people and you're regurgitating them, reinterpreting them, internalizing it, and you think it's you mm -hmm. and it's not. 
So I think number one, it's about that awareness of, you know, what is the, the I don't know, I'm the, you're the professional, the id, like the Freud id, or, ego, but, and the super ego. Yep. Right, yep. right. So it's understanding that part. Yep. Like, you know, in my book, I call it the I I was before the I that I thought I was. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> and um, so understanding that is that internal conversation positive? Mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by people who are driven by negative talk. <laughs> like that shit. And I'm really, because I don't have that. No. Like those people go, well, you know, I really want to do this thing, but I don't really think I'm good enough or no one's going to like me. I don't, that is not a filter. Mm-hmm. So I ask a lot of questions of people who think like that. I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. Like, so you want to do this. <laughs> but you're selling yourself you can't do it because of all these reasons yeah and no one is telling you this but you or your mother told you that because my father used to tell me you can't do this you can't do that i'm like whatever dude like you're gonna end up dead or in jail as much as he told us great shit he's tell me that bullshit too mm. and i was like nah I'm just, it's not, <laughs> right i don't i don't that. accept it i don't believe it which you you know in the work i do it, it i see it often and i'm often trying to help people to to change the story in their own heads, change their own narrative. Because for whatever set of reasons, they have a narrative. And from my vantage point, the narrative is false. And even from, even if it was my vantage point from them, mm-hmm. it is not, it's a story that is not helping you right. and really trying to help them to make that adjustment. So I really, I really love that. So the other part of that though, because I think about a major breakthrough I had at, in 2018, I was 50 one years old talked about my parents separating when I was 10. So I carried the wound Mm -hmm. of that abandonment of my mother leaving Mm -hmm. the first woman I ever loved and how that played out in my relationship choices with women and that journey and all of that sort of toxic, you know, unconscious behavior that I was working from, right? And what it took to get to that point. So I started with a therapist, probably 21 years old, 22 years old. Um, Mm. And so I've had different ones over the years at different times for different reasons. Family therapy, solo myself, me and my kids. um, So getting aware of, you know, the unconscious mind, I think is about wellness more than anything and and not knowing especially the things that we don't even know we're doing because we you know like i didn't realize i was abused till i was 23. yeah i got, I got beaten with extension cords till yeah. i bled like kunta kinte and i could watch a movie like 12 years a slave and when lupita's character is getting whipped i had to look at the negative space on the film where there was no person she's yeah. the way steve mcqueen framed it she's on the right side of the frame I'm looking at the negative space because my body's reacting to that shit. Yeah. Um, there's a so, big, there's a powerful book that is called the body keeps the score. Absolutely. Right? Yep. I know that. How we yeah. get triggered and all these things that happen to us. And you know, like, you know, the stuff that you're sharing now, I appreciate it because like if we had a second conversation, you know, this is our first date, right? This is our, <laughs> like, all right. I would have, that, that would have been like some of the things that I, I would have been curious about because there's this line between like, okay, what we learn that helps us and keeps us and drives us, but also people cross that line and then it could be abusive or create trauma or negativity for us and how we find a way how to work through that. And it sounds like you, you have been doing that work for some time. Cause even when you talk about like your mother and relationships, that's something that people don't even recognize. They, they, mess up relationships, make mistakes and choices that aren't good for them. And they don't realize, yo, it's connected. There's a, there's a reason why we do these things. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Another that, question? that yeah. Another so the, question? The, the last question is, uh, and I think once again, you've been sharing this, what mental wellness advice would you give to your younger self as young as yesterday or any time before that? Well, I feel really fortunate that I started practicing Buddhism when I was 16. I started practicing Nichiren Shoshu Buddhism, which um, 
teaches that for every reaction there's a reaction, right? The law of cause, causality, cause and effect is really the undergirding of it. So learning as a teenager, how we think is an action so there will be a reaction and that is what creates your reality. Yeah. So I feel fortunate that I was exposed to Eastern thought very early on. You know, I was reading, you know, Gary Zukov, Seat of the Soul or Deepak or Wayne Dyer or Louise Hay. Yeah. All that shit as a teenager. Wow. So, and that's thanks to my mother. <clears throat> I don't think my father ever got to any of that stuff. <laughs> As if for him, it was all about the Quran. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I feel like that understanding set me up to always stay open mm -hmm. to constantly seek wisdom and knowledge of self and reading books on psychology. So um, I don't know if I would do anything different than, you know, because I feel like my younger self allows me to be who I am today. And, and yeah. honestly, that younger self put me in a lot of spaces because people couldn't believe I was young, like the age I was because of what I understood. <laughs> so, um, I no. think that's, yeah, I think that's no, the I, I hear that. And, you know, Malik, I, I really appreciate like all that you shared, all that, that you dropped, uh, and in the way of, you know, what sticks out to me is just your drive once again, to impact the community, to empower the community, <clears throat> through your gifts and talents and know that like that's also a way for you to earn money for yourself and your family and whether it be tv and film music uh, uh real estate development entrepreneurship or all the above that you you're about you know all at the job them right like all <laughs> everything that you could use your skills to do uh, you're going to do it and you're not going to let hold you know hold back or be uh, resistant. So I, I appreciate you sharing, being here today, uh, spending this time with me. And uh, before we go, uh, is there any last thoughts? Oh, well, before I say that, I look forward to an opportunity for us to continue to connect. Uh, I love what you're doing. And I think there could even be opportunities for us to collab or figure out ways 1, to support people. 1, and so I look yeah. forward to figuring that out and us working together. Uh, and with that, is there any last thoughts that you have uh, before? Now, I'm proud right? of you, brother. I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing. I'm happy to see that Jamaican flag yeah, permanently on. displayed on your left side there. Even if it's a little out of focus, I like it. It's very right. cinnamon. Right. Oh, right. you're okay. done, though. You're done. Now. You're top about the rules. <laughs> Jamaican. Yeah, man. Yeah, no, man. I mean, yo, you know, this is just part one. We'll do a part two and, you know, we'll link up. Um, yeah. I I'm actually going to. I know those emails going back and forth, but so you have my direct. I'm gonna send it to you right now. I appreciate that. You can send me a um well, I'll, 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 before we end this. Good, good. And I will uh I appreciate that. I will hit you up right now so that you know. And yeah. look, man, I'm I, I'm proud of you too, man. Like the way that you are continuing to go after it and everywhere you go, like you make an impression and people see it and and that your daughter is seeing it and that to me is powerful because that's what legacy is about you know i i'm i'm striving to create a legacy that my kids see now not like you know yeah. when i'm gone and that they like oh you know, your dad did that and so i love what you're doing so i appreciate that yeah man you got it all right respect yeah. Reggie. all right man thank, right. thank you so much yeah, all man. right i'll all talk right. to you Let's. thanks wow what an incredible ride we just went on with another great member of the Leapcast community. I appreciate you listening and hope you got some tangible value from the episode. Please let us know what you think by leaving a comment, rating, and review. As always, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Dr. George James, and I'll see you next time.